Thank you. Um, thanks everyone for coming. I know this is, uh, this is the last session and uh, there's a party w waiting you, so I try to uh, wrap it up uh, as fast as I can. Um, a little bit about me. I'm right now a software engineer at Databricks, uh, and uh, I'm primarily focusing on improving the R experience at Databricks. That includes the Databricks R notebooks and uh, Spark R. And before that, I, I used to be a data scientist. <clears throat> and just a matter of uh, uh, in introducing my employer, Databricks was uh, founded by the team that created Apache Spark at UC Berkeley. We are basically working to make big data simple, and we do it through our product, which is a unified analytics platform. Okay, now, um, what is this talk going to be about? This is basically a distilled summary of what we have learned in the field from our customers who use Spark R with big data uh, to kind of transfer the knowledge and summarize everything. So in this talk, I'll be talking about the Spark R architecture. I'll talk about some, of, some uh, implementation details. Um, and then I'll introduce the common performance and usability bottlenecks and what are the sources of errors and how to debug your code when you run into them. So what this talk is not is I'm not going to introduce any new APIs. I'm not going to introduce any new features. And it's not going to be a how-to on Spark R. I think the Spark R community uh, especially Spark Summit attendees have kind of matured to a level where now we need more deep dives into Spark R. There are lots of uh, uh, previous uh, Spark Summit talks on, that introduce Spark R and different aspects of it and how to use it. I encourage you to check them out if you're interested in uh, more uh, introductory stuff. So the outline, I'll first start with a broad architectural overview, then uh, some of the details uh, regarding implementation. And um, as I do that, I will uh, point out to common problems and error that, errors that occur and uh, how we uh, help our customers debug their Spark R code. So what is it? Spark R is uh, uh, an R package that is uh, distributed with Apache Spark. Unfortunately, it's still not available on CRAN, although there is work being done to make that happen. It provides a uh, front end in R for the um, Apache Spark, primarily the data frame API. And interestingly, data frame API in Spark was inspired by R and Pandas. And there's uh, a, a number of convenient met methods for uh, you know, working with data frames and interoperability between R and Spark data frames. So with the Spark R, you basically get best of both worlds of Spark and R. Spark is a distributed and robust computing engine. Um, and R is, very, is a dynamic environment with more than 10,000 uh, packages. It's very interactive and you, know, you get uh, nice visualizations as an example. So how, how, how is it happening? How are these two uh, married together? Uh, let's see how Spark works from a 10,000 feet when you look at a Spark cluster, this is what you would see. A Spark driver and a number of workers. And there's a JVM process running on each of these and they talk to each other. Basically the driver talks to, or the master talks to the workers. Um, the workers are the ones that actually load and manipulate the data. And the driver just tells the workers what to do. So this is one, one point to keep in mind. And with Spark's uh, extensive library of data sources, you could use the workers to load da distributed data from many, many uh, sources, you know, uh, Hadoop, S3, you know, Redshift, you name it. Now, when we add Spark, uh, Spark R into this mix, it's going to look something like this. Basically, we have an R process on the driver that talks over a local socket to the JVM process on the driver. So um, one major takeaway from uh, this picture is that when you're using Spark R, data is still being handled by the JVM process on the workers. Your R process is not touching the data. So keep that in mind. 
uh, since Spark 2.0, we can have ephemeral R processes on the workers. Each worker can have, depending on how many cores it has, uh, one or more R processes for running native R code. Um, so still, the, the data is primarily handled by the JVM on the workers, and it's transferred to the R process only when it's needed. Okay, so let's uh, zoom in a little bit and look at some of the implementation details. Um, the most important part you want to focus on is the, the driver uh, machine. And on the driver, as I said, we have the R process and the JVM process, and they talk to each other. When you start Spark R, these are the steps that happen. First, the R backend opens a server port and waits for connections on it. Okay? Uh, the, the, the Spark R package, which is residing inside the R process, will establish a connection over the local socket to that port, to that, uh, to, to, to that open port. And from that point on, each Spark R call will basically send serialized data along, uh, over this local connection and wait for its response. So it's kind of uh, synchronous. It will block until it gets back its response. Um, and the actual work is happening inside the R backend. So uh, all the method resolution and invocation is done by the JVM process. That is how it's implemented. The one thing we would like to zoom in even more is this uh, connection between the R process and the, the JVM. In Spark R, they talk using a proprietary serialization format as their wire protocol. It's very simple. Um, their basic types are serialized uh, by encoding the, the name of the type and then the binary representation as the rest of the message. Uh, and for more uh, complex types, they're basically all uh, converted to lists, and each list is uh, serialized as uh, the type, the size, the type is going to be list in this case. Basically, we literally, literally like the character L, the size of the list, and then each element is going uh, uh, to be serialized if it's a basic type. And, this, uh, and so as you can see, this is very simple. There's nothing fancy about it, but it works. Um, because it's simple and the way it's implemented, uh, and the fact that each of the elements can have a different type, uh, the implementation in R is not you know, uh, particularly efficient bec because we end up using loops in the R process and that is not uh, the b best way of uh, uh, iterating over elements in R. Anyway, so now that we know how the serialization mechanism works, let's see how a simple method invocation uh, happens. Uh, I call it a simple Spark R query because everything that is of interest to us is happening on the driver. I'll talk about uh, the more complex version where we end up dealing with workers as well. For a simple Spark R query, the user will type uh, you know, the Spark R call in, inside their uh, you know, terminal, inside the R process. Let's say calling count on a data frame. The Spark R package will uh, grab the name of the method and the arguments and serialize them into a message. And then send that message over the network to the backend. Then the backend will deserialize the message, get the method and the uh, list of arguments, and use a, do a method resolution to find what Spark method has been, is about to be called, invoke that method, get its result back, and then serialize the result using the same protocol that I just talked about and send it back to the R process. Now, the R process that is waiting on the connection will get the results back, deserialize it, and then return the result to the user in, in, uh, waiting in the R process. So this is the simple loop that happens when a user calls a simple call like count or n row or uh, something like that uh, inside Spark R. Now, what can go wrong or what are the potential sources of problems uh, in this picture? The first thing that, uh, you, uh, the first part in, that we mostly see problems happening is around serialization and deserialization. As, and as you can see, we are doing it four times and things can go wrong at any, any one of these. Uh, the second potential source of problems is uh, in, uh, finding the Spark method. Basically, 
if the method signature doesn't match, if, uh, you, you, for example, you send a, uh, you know, the, the R process asks to execute a method and sends a number of arguments and that method in Spark takes fewer or more arguments, then uh, uh, finding that method will fail or if the method name is not correct. And then sometimes when you invoke the method, something can go wrong. For example, something in the, in the cluster can go wrong and you get an error there. And finally, this uh, sending over the local socket, network socket, can, uh, uh, can be source, source of some problems, mostly performance problems as well. Now, let's uh, look at some examples. First one is serialization and deserialization. This is, a, this is one, of the, one of the errors we saw with customers. Uh, the error that the customer was seeing was uh, uh, write bin attempting to add too many elements into a raw vector. Uh, why is this happening? As I said, this, uh, the, the, the Spark R will, tr will uh, serialize everything into a message and send it over the network. And at that stage, if you're trying to do that on, a, on too large data, basically you have a very huge argument list, um, R will, uh, this is basically an error you get from write bin method, um, and it fails. Your call will fail and it will stop right there. Okay, so this is one example. Another example is on the other side in the JVM. As you can see here, um, the JVM is throwing this exception, negative array size. And that's when uh, you can't deserialize something that was sent over the network to the JVM. I'm showing these, ex uh, these example error messages just to you know, uh, give you a, a taste of what errors you might see when you run into these problems in, in, in your real, uh, real world scenario. Uh, another example is the corner case with types. Sometimes the, the R process serializes something, sends it over to the JVM. Inside the JVM, when it tries to deserialize it, it, it runs into a problem casting types. And here's an example. It's trying to uh, cast double uh, uh, when it's constructing a row to a date type. Another example is this one. It is complaining about, um, basically, inside the worker is complaining uh, about not being able to get the value of date. So these are all, you know, there, there are many, many uh, examples of these. Uh, these are all examples related to the serialization and deserialization uh, inside either the R process or the JVM on the driver, and sometimes, in this case, in the worker. Okay. The, the other, the, another example I want to show you is uh, matching the method signature, the method, and then invoking it. Here you can see that uh, the R backend handler is complaining that it cannot find DF2 calls on this uh, uh, class. And the interesting thing is, if you when you look at the actual message, it is trying. It says I can't find a class named SQLUtils.DF2 calls, which uh, is kind of confusing because. The class name is SQL utils and the method name is DF2 calls, but because we're using reflection, we get this weird, strange uh, error message. So, all I'm trying to get, to get at is introducing you to the s sources of the problem uh, because some of the errors are a little bit confusing. Now, let's move on to a more co complex uh, Spark R query. And uh, by a complex query, I mean one that invokes R process on the worker. Um, so let's see what happens here. I'm going to go over a number of steps. When a user calls one of the UDF API calls, like Spark L apply or D apply or G apply, and by the way, if you don't know what those are, uh, I recommend you look up uh, one of the talks from Spark Summit uh, in uh, Boston a few months ago uh, about uh, the, uh, the new UDF API in Spark R. We had a number of talks about introducing this API. So first thing that happens is that, similar to simple queries, the Spark R and the R process will, ser it will serialize the, the R closure. What is the R closure? Basically, when you are ca uh, we're calling a function, it will take the function definition and find all the variables that the function depends on and put them into uh, uh, one packet, and it's called closure for those who aren't familiar. Now you have something that can be executed. You have the code and all the variables that the code depends on. So it grabs the closure and serializes it. 
and then sends it over the local socket to the driver JVM. The driver will then send it over the network to all the workers, and on the other side, the worker JVM will receive it. Then it will just grab that binary packet and send it over its local socket to an ephemeral R process. One step that I'm kind of ignoring here is that this R process, if it's not already running, uh, the JVM will launch it and then uh, uh, send data to it. Then the R process will uh, deserialize that binary data that it received and execute the function. So at this point, our code, our user code has been executed inside the R process. It will then get its result back and serialize it again and transfer it over local socket to the, JV, to the JVM of the driver, the, the, the JVM of the worker, I'm sorry, and then the worker will send it over to the driver. The driver will transfer it over, to the over the local socket to the worker, and the worker will deserialize it and return the result to the user. Okay? So whole number of steps. Um, now, what can go wrong? First thing, the, the most common thing and what we have seen most uh, frequently is the execution of user code can fail. And there are a number of reasons that this could happen. I will point out to some, uh, some of the more uh, interesting examples in following slides. The second thing that can go wrong, and we have seen examples of it in our use cases, is this, the serialization and deserialization steps uh, between R and, and JVM. Um, the transfer steps can also lead to problems, but mostly those are uh, latency problems. So um, some of the common problems we have seen among our customers' use cases arise from these problems. The first one is skewing data. Um, the, the one question you want to ask when you're using the uh, R, uh, Spark RUDF a API is, is the data partitions, uh, are the data partitions uh, uniform? Or is, it, is, it, is the data partitioned the way I expect it to be? Because you, you would be surprised sometimes Spark changes the, the partitioning of your data and as a result your, um, your query might either fail or take too long to execute. I can provide more examples uh, if, if you have more time later. Uh, the second source of problem is packing too much data in the closure. So you remember I said um, the, R, the Spark R will build a closure and then serialize it. In that step, it tries to find all the variables that your code inside the function depends on. And if you're depending on, um, if you're referencing a local data frame that is, let's say, five megabytes, that means your closure will have to include all of that data. This is, a, this is very easy to, um, to ignore and end up with, with, a, with a closure of multiple megabytes or even hundreds of megabytes and as a result get all sorts of funny and interesting errors from Spark. Uh, this, actually, this closure blow up usually happens because people want to uh, take it, use auxiliary data in their user function. And the way we recommend working around it is either joining that auxiliary data with your input data frame so that it's shipped uh, to the workers through the data pipeline, which is efficient and built for it, or distribute it separately to all the workers and then read it again on the worker in your function instead of sending it over the control plane. And finally, uh, another source of problem that we see is uh, the return data schema. Basically, on the way back, when the result is being sent to, uh, to the driver, you have to specify what schema your result is, and if your, your declared schema doesn't match what you're actually returning, then you get some, some interesting errors from Sparkar. I'll show you some examples here. And basically, this was my uh, practical guide on debugging your Sparkar code. Okay, first thing. Um, as a general rule, when you want to debug your Spark R code, I highly recommend practicing reading uh, uh, Java stack traces. It, it is not uh, convenient for R users, even Python users, to do this, but you, you have to face it. You're dealing with a JVM system, and most of the errors and exceptions you, you, get, you, you will get is coming from the JVM, so you have to be able to understand it. Um, specifically, the stack trace 
keep in mind that the stack trace will include the errors from the driver and the workers. So if the, the, the error happened on the worker, you'll see basically two, two stack traces, one from the driver that is basically saying something went wrong and then uh, uh, w another stack trace from the, from the worker or, or a few of the workers that is more likely to have the exception. If the error happened on the driver and didn't even get to the worker, then you only see the stack trace from the driver. So that's another thing to keep in mind. And finally, if something happens inside, is, something went, goes wrong inside the R uh, uh, worker, basically the R process in the executor, then you should expect to see the R error inside as the message of your R uh, worker stack trace. So you get two stack traces in your error, one, for the one from the driver, one from the worker, and from uh, the stack trace of the worker, if you search enough, you'll be able to find the error that is transferred from the R process. Okay? So that's general advice. Now, more specifically, these are some of the places where um, the Spark R API is, is easy to cause errors, or we've seen people confused about these things and, and resulting in, 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 in errors. First one is data frame versus data frame. Uh, the first one is uh, data dot frame, and that's the, that's the R's native data frame uh, object. The second one is Spark's data frame. And it was so confusing that since 2.0, it was renamed to Spark Data Frame, just to make it a little bit more clear. But still, uh, it's very easy to start using Spark R API and forget that the object that you're getting back is not a local R data dot frame. And the, the, the errors you get is going to be, diff is gonna be um, um, d d different depending on what package or what function you're calling. You're going to see things like, don't know, such and such doesn't know how to deal with data of class Spark data frame. That's one, that's actually a very good error message. Another one is, uh, is this, this is, this is common and it doesn't, it doesn't give you any hint as to what the error is. It just says no method for coercing this S4 class to something something. It could be like a vector. Another one is, another example is expressions other than f such and such uh, are not supported as the first parameter of extract operator. You can see how confusing and how kind of indirect these errors are, but the root cause of all of these, these are actually took from real world examples, is the fact that a user passed a Spark data frame to a function or a package that doesn't know how to deal with it. Okay? So that's number one. Number two, be aware of distinction between R functions versus SQL ex Spark SQL expressions. And what do I mean by that? A Spark SQL expression um, is a, some code in your R driver, Spark R driver, that will be translated to JVM calls. On the other hand, R function is going to be executed on the workers. Let's look at some examples. The first one, both, you know, both sides are actually R, uh, R syntax, but the first one, filter logs dollar $type equals error, this thing is going to be converted to an expression and is going to be handled by the JVM. Whereas this function, this function here, where it does subset x types equals error, this is going to be executed inside a worker. So it's an R function, not an expression. Similar, the Spark R has if else, you pass it a data frame column and another expression, basically, and two other expressions, and it does return either this or that depending on the value. So these are expressions. There's going to be no R worker to execute these with Spark R, but this is a function. It'll touch the, the R process on the worker. The types of errors and the types of performance implications is going to be very different for expressions versus functions. OK. Next is special characters in, in, in schema names. Um, the root cause of this is that dot is a special character in Spark uh, for Spark data frames because Spark supports hierarchical or basically nested data. Spark SQL supports nested data. So you can have a data frame that has a column that has, uh, um, that has subtypes, you know, sub-elements, and each sub-element could be an array or a list, right? So basically, dot is used to, ne to, to do the nesting. 
But in R, dot is just a, a normal character. So you can have a function that has dot in its name. You can have a variable that has dot in its name. And it's not uncommon. So Spark R, when you try to parallelize an R data frame, will automatically convert dot to underscore. And in that case, you'll see a warning like this. It says, for, I'm trying to uh, parallelize or create a data, Spark data frame from the iris data set. And it says, I'm going to use uh, this underscore name instead of this dot name. And this is a good case because we see the, the warning. If you call this inside another function and don't get to see this warning or you forget about this warning, then you're going to run into all sorts of fun problems. Just to make it a little bit more fun, sometimes this conversion doesn't happen. And you end up with a dot in your name. Now it's super fun. <laughs> sometimes you, have, uh, you, have a, you actually have a dot in the name and that dot has special semantics, and sometimes that dot is converted to an, un an underscore. And in that case, if you call this dotted name, you'll not get anything. So just be aware of it, and uh, um, I, for, first of all, when you write your code, make sure if you have dots, manually convert them yourself. Don't rely on this automatic conversion in the best case. And second, if you see errors with column names, um, Double check the names to see m maybe there was a conversion happening at some stage. Okay, next uh, fun example is when you pack too much data into your closure. When that happens, you get an error like this in R. It says invoke Java failed, and the reason is the serialized task was this many bytes, which exceeds the ma maximum allowed value. It's the name of it's the option, which is this many bytes. So when customers run into this, their first reaction is, all right, I know how to fix it. I'm just going to increase this RPC message max size and be done with it. Except that um, even if it succeeds, you're going to get very bad performance. So the solution is not having too large closures. And in order to do that, if you recall, you need to think about the problem. Why are you putting so much data in your closure? Um, either parallelize that using the data plane or send it to your workers and read it, uh, read it separately. Another example is um, when using the UDF API, if your worker returns empty results, you're going to get an exception like this, which you know, I should admit doesn't make any sense. It, it has no hint of what went wrong, but this is how you get, how, uh, you know, what you get. It says array index out of bound. And, and the cause, when you, you get a huge stack trace, and then the cause is array index out of bound. So what is happening here inside, in this case, the customer was filtering something using the, um, the, UDF, the UDF, UDF API. So inside the worker, they were filtering partitions of the data. Some of those partitions after the filtering will end up with nothing. And an empty array was returned to the JVM. And when it was trying to cast it to a, uh, to, a, to a Spark data frame, it would get into this problem. Obviously, this is a bug that can be fixed, but um, it wasn't intuitive for the user at that point what is going on. OK, so these are the, the examples that I had and I had seen in the field and wanted to share with you, hopefully, when you run into them you know uh, exactly how to solve your problem. I want to give um, some um, pointers here. If you'd like to try Spark R, um, I, you can use, uh, try our community or free edition of Databricks. Uh, you're going to get Databricks Runtime 3, which is optimized you know, Apache Spark for the cloud. And specifically related to R, we recently announced support for Sparkly R, which is another open source package that exposes Spark API to, the, to our users. And with this Databricks Runtime 3, the latest version of our cluster that you, you can use, um, you'll be able to try out Sparkly R. And with that, I would be glad to answer any questions. Uh, cool. Thank you, Hussein. Um, so we're actually out, about out of time for this session, but we don't have um, one immediately after this, so I'll just leave the mic here, and if you guys have questions, uh, feel free to ask.
Uh, so I had a quick question about uh, how, like, how would how would you compare the type of errors you hit in Spark R to something like PySpark? Like, are there are they similar? Are they different? Are there things unique to R that? Because I feel like there are a lot more here than like as a PySpark user I, I would normally see. Yeah, um, I think error, the the state of error messages is, is worse in Spark R compared to PySpark. Uh, part of it is because uh, just maturity. In PySpark, a lot of the things are caught and convert, translated to um, more readable or uh, uh, you know, natural error, uh, error uh, messages. Uh, the other part is that so, uh, there are just basically fewer corner cases because they've been resolved over time. So you, en you don't end up with all these uh, um, um, you know, unfamiliar stack traces. Hopefully in a year, uh, Spark R is going to be a little bit better or uh, in par with PySpark in terms of errors. So I have a question regarding Sparkly R. So how, how different is Sparkly R with Spark R? And if we want to use Spark, for, Spark R for, with production, for production, which ones we should prefer? Um, so how different it is. And there was a deep dive session uh, um, about an hour ago by uh, Javier, which uh, did a very good job introducing Sparkly R, its roadmap, and its architecture. Um, if you didn't attend it, when the slides and the video is up, I highly recommend you check it out. That will give you a lot of details of what it is, and then you can compare them. In terms of which one you would use, I think it's, uh, uh, there are many external parameters. So it's not just a decision that you want to make in the, in the vacuum. Uh, for example, if you are already using dplyr, then probably Sparkly R is a better choice because it, it is basically a backend for dplyr and you, you, can, you can convert your code much easier. If you want to use, you want to parallelize your existing R code, um, Spark R has had support for user-defined functions for um, about a year or so, whereas Sparkly R is working on it. So maybe later down the road, you could also use Sparkly R for that. But for now, y your, your choice is limited to Spark R. And other than that, I think there are some um, uh, matters of taste. So depending on the use case, you might find one more convenient or more stable than the other. Uh, hi. So uh, I have a question about, I'm a beginner to Spark R. I, I use Sparkly R a bit. So it, it seems to be very natural to like Spark data frames and the regular data frames. You can use DeepLire like, in a similar way. And, but for Spark R, I had trouble finding like what I thought I would find something like, let's say there's some native types like raw matrix in uh, Spark, right? There's some indexed raw matrix, or there's some interesting types in there. And I couldn't find anything that would be like, somewhat similar in Spark R. So that would be kind of a structure. Like data frame in uh, R match, maps very well to the Spark data frame, but there was really nothing. I think I found the best one, some kind of distributed list uh, some kind of representation for this. Uh, what would be the best strategy to work with? If uh, the underlying, let's say, I'm using algorithm that produces back some kind of just a, a, like raw matrix. Yeah, I don't What's think we, we have a good solution in either packages for that. Um, so, the, so far, so one thing to, to remember, Spark R uh, calls, they, they're basically, it just wraps the data frame API. And the benefit is that everything will go through Catalyst and gets optimized. And Sparkly R uh, does similar thing. As a result, it benefits from, the, from all the data frame and SQL optimizations. If you go to native types, like mat matrices or you know, vectors and whatnot, then you can't get this optimization. And I think that's something that hasn't been implemented yet. But is there any way to proceed in that case? Oh, should I just completely switch to Scala? Yeah, no, there, there are ways. You could do it. So, Spark, if, if, the, if, you, if there's a data structure that Spark supports it, yes. right, you could call uh, the, the Java methods using both either Spark R or Sparkly R. Sparkly R has invoke, an invoke API that mm -hmm. allows you to call a JVM call. And Spark, sorry, Sparkly R has invoke API. Spark R has something similar called Spark R dot uh, uh, J, J is static or Spark R that J invoke. I, uh -huh. I, may, I may not be accurate there. But basically, there's a method. So you could implement the core of your algorithm in, um, in, in, in Scala and then wrap it 
using Spark R or Sparkly R and then expose it to users in R, basically as front-end languages, not as the core implementation. Thank you. Thank you.